welcome to History of Graphic Narratives. In this early lecture, we want to lay out some of the basic ideas that we're going to be talking about here. To begin with, let's look at this typical American comic by Ernie Bushmiller, Nancy. In this comic, we see a standard layout of a series of pictures that work together in a way to tell a story, a gag. And in this case here, we are, our eye is drawn toward a kind of movement within the series of panels as we read the action from left to right, just as we might read a book. But quite different from reading a book, reading a graphic narrative our eye moves back and forth along a more convoluted path. Let me show you what I mean. When we first see Nancy, we look to her and we see Sluggo. And Sluggo is then squirting squirt gun at the girl. And then we see him do it again to the boy. And then our eye goes right to that water faucet and we follow the hose down to the holster, where we imagine there is a water squirt gun hose there. And finally, we see Nancy looking right at Sluggo, who is drawing his arm. And we have those wonderful little wags by his arm. We know it's moving. And then we see him looking back at her. And so the comic ends not with a movement off the page, but a movement back into the action. And the final moment isn't shown. The final moment is understood. Nancy is about to show Sluggo her squirt gun. And we can imagine what's going to happen next, but we don't see it. And that's what makes this so wonderful. It's a gag setup, but there's no final gag action within the comic. It happens immediately after. And so we laugh because we understand how to read and know what's going to happen next. Now above Sluggo, we see a speech bubble. And you'll notice that in each one, he's saying the exact same thing. Again, the speech bubble there doesn't add a whole lot of information, but it does set up a wonderful comic timing. And you'll notice that the size of the panels creates a sort of a setting and then an establishing kind of a little bit faster, shorter moment. And then this longer, larger last thing creates this moment, this space for this final action to take place, a kind of dramatic build. Okay, so you see the splash, we see the dripping faucet, we see the little wags above the elbow. There are lots of symbols that show us action, that allow us to read these things. We call these sort of extra visual elements of a comic that are communicating ideas such as motion and, and sometimes water splat. This is called emanata, things that sort of come out of the picture. And this is a very important way in which cartoonists communicate the story to us in a very vivid and graphic way. Now, in a comic, there are lots of different elements that come to play. First of all, we need to know how to read because there's literacy. We're going to follow this like we might a book. And it's laid up in a linear way like a book. And of course, the words are there. So literacy is a very important component, especially in this early kind of um, narrative sequencing. Next, there's a certain kind of distortion that's happening in the pictures, an exaggeration of gestures and actions and postures and facial expressions, which can be largely sort of grouped into something called caricature, which is a very innovative way of kind of stretching and distorting what we see in the pictorial world with a kind of emphasis on emotion and movement. Then we have this idea of sequential action. This is a sequence of pictures, which is a different from just a group of pictures with no sense of time. The fact that we understand that one thing is leading to another, that comes to another, and that the size and shape of the panel is giving us a 
information about what's happening in the sense of time. All of these are very sophisticated mechanisms of reading that we have learned to experience through years and years of exposure. Now, Scott McCloud is a cartoonist who wrote a book called Understanding Comics. In this book, he wanted to sort of tell people that there's more to comics than what you typically might read in a superhero comic. And his goal was to kind of say that there's a kind of a, a form to comics, the content of comics, that there's styles and subject matter and theme, which is the content, but really there's something more essential. And here, of course, he's very critical of the typical comic book content. And he wants to look at the sort of form of comics and how they communicate. And so that's one of my goals here in this lecture is to kind of talk to you about how comics communicate their form and their ideas. I'm going to follow Scott McCloud, and the most important thing to begin when we talk about this is this idea that what a picture is. Well, a picture is not the thing itself, which seems very obvious, and of course it's one of those things that makes this painting by Magritte so funny. He says, this is not a pipe in French. And of course we look at it, and it's clearly a pipe. But is it a pipe? No, it's not a pipe. It is a painting of a pipe. Now that seems like a semantic difference, but it's important because pictures don't become things. They are representations of things. And so that's just kind of the nature of the way we see pictures. We sometimes blur this boundary. We take pictures for representation of things. If someone had a, a, a picture of the Pope or some other thing like the flag and you tore it, you might feel they were violating those ideals that those pictures represent. But in reality, they are just pictures. So we have to remember that this is not a cow, this is not a car, that we're looking at a representation of a thing. And this he calls an icon, right? And it's important to think about things as how they're represented because how something is depicted changes the way we understand it in a very interesting way. So like we could see a photograph at one end, which is a very realistic copy of something. It's just a mechanical light bouncing off the object. It's as close as we can get to the way the eye renders something. But any kind of drawing is going to take us further and further away from that photographic ideal and start to make us more aware of the, the essence of the thing being represented. And so in here he's saying, when you look at a picture, you're looking at one person. And then when you're looking at these sort of more drawn and stylized forms, we're looking at more general representation of people, such that they start to represent a kind of group of people, not just one individual, but a kind of class or stereotype of a person. So when we finally get to the simple smiley face, not so smiley face, um, we see just the representation of a face, it hardly could identify any individual at all. He makes this distinction because he feels like this is grounded in the way we see the world. That when we look at other people and we're talking to other people, we see them with a kind of clarity that represents the real world outside of us. But when we are thinking about ourselves, our own self-image is actually a kind of simplified version of that picture and that we keep in our mind as we're speaking, we're sort of loosely aware of what our face is doing in this kind of simplified way. And he makes this rather important distinction because he says these simplified versions of faces, these are just us projecting our own face onto the icon.
that we can see a face in these simplified things because we are lending it our own features. We are lending it our own identity. This is why things that are cartoony or simplified representations can be very powerful ways in which we identify with them. We identify with them because we feel that they are a part of us. Now we can take the idea of representation even further and we can go beyond the simple graphic image into something more abstract, the words. Now, the shape of a letter and the combinations into words is really random. There is no logic to them. We have learned how to read and we've learned how to interpret these symbols. And yet they can have a certain kind of force of communicative power, which is quite different from what we see or, or when we read a book or we read a sign. Now, some comics are what we would call word dependent, where the pictures uh, are there, but they don't communicate enough to understand what's really going on. And other comics are picture dependent. There's almost no words at all, and we're there to sort of interpret what we're seeing and understanding from just the pictures. And so these two different modes of, work, of communicating are very important sort of boundaries within what's possible with a comic. How much of the picture is told through words? How much of the story is told through pictures? In a comic, a very special kind of thing can happen where you have a very unique way of communicating with both words and pictures. In this case here, we see a map um, as the character's kind of planning out how he's going to rendezvous with this woman. And so, in a kind of humorous way, we're no longer looking at something which is either a word or a picture, but a kind of ra graphic representation of an idea. And that's the thing that's so wonderful about comics, is they can communicate and do things which would be impossible, say, in a movie, or uh, a TV show or any other kind of means of communication. And so this sort of interdependent way of communicating is really one of the wonderful sort of hallmarks of comic art. You can start to see the way in which words and pictures kind of blend and fuse together in really interesting ways. So this is sort of this two parts of our idea of the graphic narrative, words and pictures. But there's a third way in which we look at and experience the graphic narrative, and that is on a just a sort of visual way. Now, the words and how they visually represent themselves, or even the pictures and how they visually represent themselves, give us another layer of information that we interpret visually. Now, pure visual communication is something like abstract art. You can't tell a story here. There is no narrative to speak of. Alexander Calder and his mobiles has created a number of beautiful, pleasing shapes and the way they move and interlock uh, creates a kind of visual excitement. But we couldn't interpret this as a school of fish swimming or a block of a flock of birds flying. It, it, it may give us some sensations or experiences like that, but it would be over determining the, the poetry of the pure visual experience to understand it in those realistic terms. That said, a lot of times graphic narratives make pictures which are visually stimulating and beautiful. There's a kind of excess of information that allows for a kind of confusion of what the narrative is all about that forces us to slow down and look closely and carefully understand the relationship of the elements. Unlike Ernie Bushmiller, this kind of narrative is very complex and it's meant to stimulate this third area of our 
of viewing experience, the pure pleasure of looking. So when you're thinking about comics, think about the relationship of words and pictures. How realistic is this comic? How stylized? What is the quality of the language? Is it rich and dense or is it simple and forceful and graphic? And what are the pictorial qualities? Is it richly abstract or is it grounded in something very familiar? These are some of the ways I want you to think about the pictorial vocabulary of the comics you're reading.